Hi, I'm Tony Northup and for my photography buying guide today I'd like to go over Canon versus Nikon. Which is better and for who? Going to be covering the differences between the bodies as well as the lens and flash selection and finally at the end I'll be providing specific suggestions for different types of photographers whether you should join the Canon or the Nikon family. And I know what a lot of you are saying, what about all the other manufacturers? Sony, Panasonic, Olympus, Fuji, Samsung. We've reviewed cameras from all these manufacturers and they all have their own places and values. But for a lot of us, it's still Canon versus Nikon. Those are the two biggest companies. And they have vastly better selections of lenses and flashes than are available for the other systems, at least natively. But we will talk about it a little bit more as we go through it and you'll start to see the importance of these differences as I provide specific examples. So jumping into the bodies. Now part of what brings me to do this is that we recently reviewed the Nikon D810 here and compared it against my favorite camera up until I met the D810, the 5D Mark III. And Chelsea and I both loved the D810 so much that we were completely ready to switch to Nikon and not look back at Canon at all. So I started to do that and I ran into problems. <laughs> I was just going to sell off my Canon lenses and buy the Nikon equivalent. But there were a few deal breakers. So let's get into it. What we found from Nikon was that Nikon simply had more sharpness more because they have more pixels and therefore they get more detail out of sharp lenses. They had more dynamic range and as far as video cameras go, they pretty much all the new cameras can capture 60 frames a second. The Canon cameras are still at 30 frames a second and that's a real difference. You see much smoother video, 60 frames a second, having the option is just better. I know not everybody cares, but it's good. Um, the Canon cameras across the lineup, uh, honestly, they don't have a lot of distinct advantages. You can compare two specific cameras and find some benefits with the camera. Maybe you like the buttons on the Canons better, but pretty much the only benefit they seem to have across the board is a little bit of a bigger buffer, which is good if you take, you know, 10, 20, 30 shots at a time. The Nikon might run out of buffer and start shooting slower than the Canon. But again, it kind of depends on the specific model that you're shooting with. So generally, my feeling is Nikon bodies are just better than Canon bodies at, at this current state in technology. It's been a long time since Canon released something new. Maybe they'll have something new here soon. To get a specific example here, the Canon T5 versus the Nikon D3300. They're roughly equivalent, about the same price point. This is their entry level cameras. Uh, I have the D3300 here. No articulating screen, just basic camera. The Canon version goes for $500 as opposed to the, the $600 on the, the Nikon version. You can get a D3200, almost the same camera for $500. The big differences are the me megapixels. The Canon has 18 megapixels while the Nikon has 24 megapixels. But here's the trick. You don't actually see any of that detail when you buy that kit because they both come with not sharp, cheapo 18 to 55 kit lenses. And DxO Mark, I'm going to be citing their statistics a lot in their, their tests, measures those both at about 9 megapixels uh, when you use those kits and look at the pictures. That's about the amount of detail you actually see in the final images. So it's a wash. Those extra 30% of the megapixels on the Nikon, you, you never appreciate any of that value. You will get more dynamic range out of the Nikon if you're a landscape photographer, if you're doing things like recovering shadows. But most photographers who buy these cameras are just casual and they don't know anything about recovering shadows. So they'll never notice a difference between these two cameras. However, if you go and upgrade and you pick up one of my favorite cameras of all time, or one of my favorite lenses, the Sigma 18 to 35 F1A, one unbelievably sharp, best lens you can get for APS-C cameras. The Canon pulls out about 15 megapixels of detail from that and the Nikon jumps up to 17 megapixels. So you can see the Nikon has about 30% more pixels and it gets about 15% more detail with a sharp lens. And we'll see that same ratio uh, as we look at some other examples. Looking at the 5D Mark III versus the D800E, D800E has almost the same sensor as the D810, not quite, but DxO Mark hasn't tested the D810 yet, so I have to cite the D800E. Um, the, the price points are pretty similar. The 5D Mark III is a little older, so the price has fallen a little bit. The D800E and the D810 have 50% more megapixels, 36 megapixels instead of 24 megapixels. And 
when you use the, the Canon and Nikon 24 to 70, this top line here, the Canon gets about 18 megapixels of detail and the Nikon gets about 21 megapixels. But when you start to use the same lenses, my favorite lenses, the third party lenses, the Tamron 24 to 70 on the Canon gets 18 megapixels. And that lens on the Nikon gets 23 megapixels. So here we see with a sharp lens using the same lens, we see 25% more detail extracted with 50% more pixels. Why the discrepancy? Well, lenses are analog and the sensors are digital. So the sensors are turning the smooth lines of the real world into little square blocks. So there's always something lost when you go from an analog to a digital conversion like that. But generally more resolution on the digital side, whether it's light or sound or something else, more resolution helps. And eventually you can get almost all that analog detail if you have enough information in the sensor and the analog details of, of quality. So we use these high quality lenses, we get good analog detail and therefore we get good digital detail out of it. At the telephoto end, if you go to the 600 f4, this is like a $10,000 lens, whether you get the Canon or the Nikon version. The Canon version gets 20 megapixels and the Nikon version gets 24 megapixels. So there we see about 20% more detail. Um, and that's, that's a pretty significant jump, especially for wildlife photographers to get 20 more 20% more detail in your images would be amazing as a wildlife photographer. That, that would be a pretty huge jump. That's like getting 20% closer to your subjects, which if you spend time camouflaged and trudging through swamps and stuff and very slowly sneaking up on your subjects, you know 20% closer is kind of a big deal. Let's jump forward and look at some examples. The biggest example, the biggest difference I found between the Canon and Icon bodies is dynamic range. And this is just a sample. It's a slide from a video that I did, the video review of the D810 versus the 5D Mark III. This is the Nikon over here on the right, and you can see this recovered night sky is so much smoother on the Nikon than it is on the Canon. Same with this example, which is the side of a house. The right side over here shows the shingles very distinctly, and on the left side on the Canon, the recovered shadows are just completely useless, just noise. So for those of us who are doing landscape photography and are serious about it, if you're doing night photography, product photography, things where you might want to recover the shadows, the Nikon is a clear winner. It also seems like a clear winner for sports and wildlife and things where you want to extract the extra detail. So to summarize the discussion on bodies, Nikon bodies, as far as I'm concerned, better than Canon bodies. Just on average, I know you could find specific weaknesses in the Nikon lineup, but they're generally just better because they have these amazing Sony sensors. So let's move on to the lenses. Canon generally has more variety and some of their lenses have some really important advantages. Let's talk about my favorite lens in the Canon lineup, this big white one here, the 70 to 200 f2.8, the Mark II version with image stabilization. If you measure the actual effective focal length, it ends up being about 70 to 195 millimeters at, at headshot range when you're taking a portrait. And that's where I use it a lot for my professional wedding and portrait photography. It's a really important range. DxO Mark measures the sharpness of it at, when attached to the 5D Mark III at about 21 megapixels. So the 5D Mark III has a 24 megapixel sensor. It manages to pr produce about 21 megapixels of detail. That means this is a super sharp lens and it's probably exceeding the, the detail level that the sensor can capture. Let's look at the Nikon and notice I add a little asterisk here because I feel like Nikon should do that when they describe their Mark II version of the 70-200 f2.8 lens because this is the real focal length when you're shooting up close at tight headshot range. It's about 60 to 130 millimeters. That, that's a big difference from 70 to 200. 130 millimeters at the long end, which is where you'll shoot a headshot at the long end, 130 is way shorter than 200. That means to get the same subject size, you need to move, could be about 75% closer to your subject. You don't have the same working distance. It also means that you're not getting as much compression of the facial features or as much background blur. You'll have more background and it won't be as nicely blurred. But that Nikon lens, man, attached to the, D8, uh, the D800E, 27 megapixels. <laughs> so it gets substantially more detail, about 30% more detail than the 5D Mark III could possibly capture. So a lot more detail, but you can't get to the same focal length. And as far as I'm concerned, I, I could sacrifice a little sharpness, especially for portraits, but I can't sacrifice that 200 millimeter. Here's 
some stats. I went through my own Lightroom catalog. Of the shots that I took with that 70 to 200, over one third of them were taken at the full 200 millimeter length. And of the shots taken over 150 millimeters, the, the range that does not exist on the Nikon version when focusing at close range, uh, about 60%. So most of my shots are taken at a range that I wouldn't be able to achieve on the Nikon. And that's a real problem for me. That means that I cannot replace that Canon 70 to 200 with the Nikon version of it. I'm out of luck. But wait, <laughs> this is an example of the type of shot that you get at 200 millimeters and f2.8. A lot of pop, fantastic features, blown out background. It's something I can't give up. It's a key part of my portrait and wedding photography. It's a key element I need for candid work too in those environments. On the left, we have a picture taken at 200 millimeters with the Canon, and on the right, we have a picture taken with the Tamron f2.8, but it has the same focus breathing problem as the Nikon, so I'm gonna use it as an example. You can see that it's actually about 140 millimeters, and this just shows the difference. Uh, first, Chelsea's facial features are more flattering when taken at 200 millimeters because it helps to compress, makes the forehead, nose, chin smaller, so you don't get that same compression at 140 millimeters which is the maximum achievable by the Nikon lens or the Sony or the Tamron lens, all the third-party lenses. But also look at the background blur there. Look at that uh, shed in the background, how much smaller it is on the uh, Tamron lens, the shorter lens versus the Canon, and how much less nicely blurred it is. You can definitely see a more distinct shape, shape of the shed, whereas it almost disappears in the background on the Canon. And this isn't even a tight headshot. This is a little bit wide. Uh, I often shoot headshots cropped well into the hairline and right into the shoulders, and the effect would be even more pronounced at those tighter ranges. But wait, Nikon has a Mark I version of the lens that doesn't have this focus breathing problem. When focusing at headshot ranges, it really is pretty close to 200 millimeters, about 190 millimeters. DxO Mark rates it at about 20 megapixels of detail, so not quite as sharp, at least if you look at that one number. So the Nikon Mark I and the Canon Mark II seem to have about the same sharpness, but let's go into DxO Mark's data a little bit deeper. And I really want to plug DxO Mark. I'm using a lot of their data, and I hope that's okay, uh, because they provide better detail than anybody. So if you want this sort of technical information about camera bodies and lenses, go to dxomark.com. It can save you a ton, a ton of time and testing and probably save you a lot of money if you can figure out all the technical aspects of it. This is their sharpness chart for both the Canon and the Nikon. And over on the left of both of these charts, they show you the sharpness at 70 millimeters over to 200 millimeters. And then vertically, it's f2.8 at the bottom and f22 at the top here for the Nikon or, or f36 uh, for the Canon. Now, as I was saying, most of my shots are shot more telephoto, so they're going to be in the right side of these charts. So if you look at the Canon, all the way from 70 to 200 at f2.8 wide open, it's nice and green. That means it's going to be nice and sharp, over 12 megapixels of detail. But look at the Nikon. Everything's green right until you get here. But the problem is, this is where I do all my shooting. <laughs> right here, this is the most important corner. That's where every headshot is going to be taken and it suddenly gets all red and bad, and look how much detail it has there. So that 20 megapixels of detail in the Mark I version of the Nikon is kind of an average of the entire spectrum. But the part I really need is down here, and it's way worse. Let's zoom in to just 200 millimeters in f2.8 and look at what DxO Mark's data says about this. The Canon, you can see, edge to corner, all green. That means nice and sharp. But 200 millimeters f2.8 on the Nikon Mark I is sharp only in the very center, and everywhere else it's going to be quite unsharp. So I have the Mark II version of the Nikon lens, which only goes to like 135, 140 millimeters. The headshot range isn't long enough. The Mark I version is long enough, but at the specific focal length and aperture I would use, it's not sharp enough for me. I'd be taking a big hit on sharpness, and that would make no sense for me to make that change since sharpness is one of the things I really liked about the Nikon. So it kind of seems like I can't replace the Canon. So the lesson I'd like to, to convey here is that sometimes you pick a camera, but sometimes you pick a lens, and then you grab whatever camera works with the lens that you want. And in my experience, I, I want 
to replace the Canon with a Nikon, but there doesn't seem to be a replacement for the Canon 7200 F2.8. Now, what about all those other manufacturers I mentioned? Olympus, Panasonic, Fuji. None of them have the equivalent of a 70-200 to F2.8 on a full-frame lens. Not one of them. Only Canon has this one specific lens. So I thought, I love the Canon 200mm F2.8 Prime. It gives me that sweet spot. It's very sharp. I'll just pick up the Nikon version. It doesn't exist. Canon has one, Nikon doesn't have one. Going down to more casual portraiture where people always start with an APS-C body and an inexpensive lens, the first lens I tell people who are into portraiture to get is the 50mm f1.8, the fantastic plastic, the nifty 50. Here's another benefit of the Canon world. The Canon version costs $100. You can go to Amazon right now, get the gray market version for $100 shipped. The Nikon version, AFS, which you need for autofocus on all these bodies is $216. Nikon has a cheaper one, but it doesn't have autofocus and you need autofocus for portraiture. So $116 doesn't seem a lot if you're spending this much money on cameras, but for people who bought a base model camera and felt like four or $500 was already kind of painful, but they want to get good portraits, that, that extra $100 is a huge difference. So for me, if I'm telling somebody who wants to get into casual portraiture, which system to get into, I'm going to feel a lot more comfortable telling them to get a Canon APS-C body in that $100 lens because the Nikon version is simply going to cost them more. They'll have an extra $115 in their pocket. They could use that to get a nice flash to add a little fill flash or diffusers and tripods and reflectors and things that could really make a difference in their photography. I'll also add that the Nikon lens is better has way less chromatic aberration and it's a little sharper and all that, but they don't have a cheaper version. I need to be able to give people a hundred dollar lens because they don't so much care at that level about the technical details of the sharpness, but they sure care about that nice background blur that you can get with either of these lenses. Anyway, I wish Nikon had a cheaper alternative. They don't. Another lens that I love in the Canon world and use all the time and recommend to all beginning and middle level wildlife photographers is the Canon 400mm f5.6 does not exist for the Nikon world. They don't have one and Nikon wildlife photographers are always upset about it. Yes, they have the 300 f4 and yes, you can put a teleconverter on there, but by the time you buy the teleconverter and the 300 f4, you might as well buy that and a used 7D, which is the setup I have there. The teleconverter for, the, for Nikon will cost you about as much as a used 7D. <laughs> So you might as well buy a second body and stick that lens on it and just have an extra Canon and use the Nikon for every other type of work. Another lens that I love a lot is the MPE. It's a highly specialized lens. I don't recommend a lot of people get this, but if you want crazy macro, <laughs> like seeing every individual eyelet in a fly or a jumping spider, this goes up to 5x magnification. It just means tiny things are huge. And it's awesome, and Canon only has it. Nikon doesn't have something like that. So what I'm getting at is Canon simply has a better variety of lenses, and some key lenses, like that 50mm f1.8 and the 70-200 f2.8, have huge advantages over the Nikon versions, and there simply is no third-party equivalent that I could recommend people to. It's too bad. Now, I didn't really talk about it, but in the shorter ranges, like 24 to 70, 24 to 105, I'm telling everybody to go to Tamron and Sigma for those. So for those, they're exactly equal. And I, if I'm shooting in that range for travel or a casual events or whatever, I'm grabbing the DA10 and the Tamron 24 to 70 or the Sigma 24 to 105, because that's my favorite setup and it's better than the Canon. And if one of those companies would make a decent, 70 to 200, that's truly 200 at the short end and nice and sharp, I would sell my, the rest of my Canon gear, but I can't do it right now. Let's talk a little bit about flashes. We won't see as big of a difference here, but there is kind of a big difference. And once again, kind of Canon pretty much has the advantage. One of my favorite flashes to recommend for the beginning photographer is the Yongno YN568EX2. It's Canon only. It supports high-speed sync and ETTL only with Canon cameras, and they don't have a version for Nikon for some reason. I think the Nikon system might be a little more complex for third parties to integrate into. I'm not sure. You can get the previous version of this flash, the YN568, but it's missing some key features like the ability to remotely control other name brand flashes. So anyway, it's not a huge difference, but it seems pretty consistently that uh, there are more third-party 
flashes available for Canon and they, ha they support more features than they do in the Nikon world, you basically end up buying more expensive lenses for Nikon and spending more money. The Photix Metros Plus is the flash that I grab just all the time nowadays. It's my favorite. They communicate wirelessly so you can get three of them and control them all really nicely. It works great. They're kind of expensive at $400 plus. And right now they're available for Canon and Nikon. But I had mine since the fall of last year for Canon and they didn't come out for Nikon until mid-February. This actually happens a lot with third parties. They'll release their gear and lenses for, Ni for Canon first and then at some later point for Nikon. Nikon's always kind of an afterthought and it gets frustrating in the Nikon world. For example, it, the Tamron 150 to 600 zoom came out for Canon first and then like months and months later for Nikon, but everybody was dying for it. So there's this little bit of frustration because Canon's a little bit bigger than Nikon. So these third parties make all their products for Canon first. Nikon's sometimes an afterthought. Name brand radio flashes. Canon has the 600 system, which uses radio frequency to communicate with remote flashes, much more reliable than light, optical, or, or IR communications, which most other flashes use. Nikon has no such thing. You'd have to go back to the Metros Plus system. I don't really recommend the Canon system to most people anyway. I like the, the Metros or a third-party RF system better. But where are you on this, Nikon? You don't have an RF system yet. It's largely a portrait photographer thing, but it's another reason that I might urge portrait photographers to move towards Canon instead. So let's look at different types of photography and what different people should go to. If you're a casual photographer, it doesn't really matter. Canon, Nikon, grab a Sony, grab a Micro Four Thirds camera, uh, grab a Samsung. They're all going to get the job done. Most of these casual photographers only ever use the kit lens anyway. It's not going to be especially sharp. They'll never notice any difference. They're not doing anything that really presses their hardware. Doesn't matter. Let's go take pictures. If you're a landscape photographer and you get serious about it, I would definitely urge you to look into the Nikon world. The difference in sharpness and dynamic range will make a visible difference in your pictures and it will save you processing time too. Make sure you get a good lens though because your kit lens probably isn't going to cut it. In the sports world, because Canon bodies sometimes have a little bit better focusing systems, the DA10 is an exception to that. It beats the 5D Mark III for me. Um, but the fact that you can get that 50 millimeter f1.8 for $100 and that 70 to 200 is actually much longer makes a big difference for sports like basketball and soccer. So I feel like I still have to push sports photographers towards the Canon world, at least sort of amateur sports photographers. If you're a wildlife photographer and you got to spend less than 10K, which is most of us, right? I still got to push people towards that setup of the 7D and the 400 millimeter f5.6. Nikon just really doesn't have an equivalent. They just don't have an equivalent. It would cost a lot more. If you're a wildlife photographer with a big budget, big five-figure budget, however, I would definitely send you to the Nikon world. For me, I'd get a D810 and a 500mm f4 or 600mm f4. They're substantially sharper than the Canon equivalents without any price penalty. You'll simply get better pictures, and that's what it's all about. For portraits, as I've kind of said, uh, it seems like we're stuck with Canon. <laughs> I sure wish I could use my Nikon body, but I can't get a lens for it and it, it's really frustrating me. So for other portrait photographers who are just getting into it, I'm going to have to continue to push them into the Canon world simply because of lens and flash availability. Nikon still makes the better bodies, but Canon's got it on everything else. Just a side note, people always ask me which is better, Nikon or Canon for video. I, I would say neither. I'm going to push you towards Panasonic for anything video. Um, get a GH whatever you can afford. <laughs> if you have 1700 bucks, the GH4 is stellar. The predecessor of the GH3 is excellent. We are recording this with GH2s. Um, they're generally just better video cameras than their DSLR equivalent. So that's my recommendation for that. Thanks so much for watching. If you have any questions for me, write a comment below. And if you want to see more free videos, be sure to hit subscribe. If you want to learn the ins and outs of camera gear, lenses, flashes, bodies, studio lighting, macro photography, wedding photography, whatever, any questions about gear, check out my photography buying guide first. It can save you thousands of dollars and the ebook is less than 10 bucks. And I release free lifetime updates. In fact, all of this is research for a future update because I really want to make educated, 
recommendations for people, uh, educated and unbiased. I do my best to be unbiased. We've never taken a free piece of equipment or a dollar from any camera manufacturer. We just use what works best for us. So I hope you'll check that out. And if you want to learn photographic techniques, check out my book, Stunning Digital Photography. It'll teach you how to actually use your cameras and the art of photography. Thanks so much.